platform to hear and my person first and just really deep down learning what happy you know what could work foundational community support supportive housing supportive employment you know the wraparound from these community members that have so much love in their heart to give back and our volunteers and our members of our community are so strong and our resources can have the opportunity to be so robust you know so i know it works because getting into the shelter, getting into school, going to those emotional wellness classes, going to the human response network, sitting with those women that were experiencing the same thing as me, reaching into the shelter. Now I get back. My Friends Without Homes program that I do, um, uh, there's a flyer. I reach out my hand to cope to those still suffering, providing them resource navigation, warm supplies to keep them warm. Our shelter can only do so much. Our old shelter is only open and when it can be. You know, We do the best we can, but they're always needed more. So through those things, we can find recovery through the right pathway. So I try, I feel that it's a crime for me to hold this hope and recovery inside of me. So I feel like you come today to come and hear our story. Our story is strong and it's individual and every little person and every person in this community holds such an amazing amount of hope in them to give back. And it can be done through supported uh, resources, through funding in our communities and the nonprofits um, the church communities and housing. We really, really need that affordable housing um, on top of it. We have a lot of barriers with policies, you know, things like that that we don't really want to get into today. Um, this is just a really an opening door for a relationship for you to just really see what Lewis County is all about. Um, we have some amazing people here that have been through a lot of things, trauma, ACEs scores, child effects that are out rocketed, score, scores high. So. I work for a program now, I have a job actually reaching out to community, um, bringing services to them for behavioral health and we just want you to know that we appreciate your support and through the Resident Action Project I've learned strategies, solutions, skills, ways that we as a community and the state can work together to bring solutions and end this housing crisis or at least bring it to a rare brief at one time experience. Thank you Lisa. Thank mm -hmm. you. I respond to it. First off, thank you for sharing your story. Your story is much more interesting than mine. I'll tell you that. So I'm um, pleased to see you today doing this great work. Could you just tell me a little bit about the Resident Action Network, what it does? And you made reference to shelter. Can you tell me just a little bit about that? What's going on in that regard? Um, the Resident Action Project is a local group of just regular citizens that are experiencing housing injustice or homelessness who fight up state, local, all the way up to the top level just to try to get the voice of the people to introduce new bills or to try to advocate for bills that are really, you know, strong for some people that, you know, maybe not, you don't know the stories sometimes when you have to work real hard up at the top. And so we try to bring the humanness, um, advocate for policy change, affordable housing, and our shelter, it's a coordinated entry. And of course, our shelters can only do so much here. And we have, a certain amount of beds so when our beds are full we have waiting lists so that that's where friends without homes come in we just walk alongside of them until people because the housing resource center will help them find their housing in the right pathway where they need to go like they did me they when i um, was in the shelter they paid six hundred dollars for me to get um, my deposit paid on my home they supported me to let the person renting to me know that they were supporting me they came in and looked at the home and made sure it was livable they let me have a safe, secure place where I could cook my food, that I could shower every day. Um, there were rules that I had to apply by, but that's necessary. So, and you know, they do the best that they can. And if that shelter would not have been there, I don't know how long I've been, it would have been in my and car. Who, who actually operates the shelter? You. Ruth. You. Ruth. 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 Next. Thank okay. Thank you. Yes, yes, you're welcome. But Resident Action Project says we're just trying to grow here in the community. We're strong Great. with numbers. So Great. just people that care. Congratulations. Thank you. Ruth, share about what what's that like? What is the work of providing these services here in this community? All right, so I'm Ruth Gutierrez, and I'm the executive director for the Housing Resource Center. And we have the two um, shelters in our community, year-round shelters. So we have a family shelter, single women shelter, which are in the same location, and we have a single men shelter as well. And Lisa was at the um, single women shelter with the families. What, it's a low barrier shelter, so that means that um, when they enter, you know, we we don't ask. We ask them to abstain, but we can't. You know, it's people have to find that path themselves. 
So the low barrier allows people to do the respite and my case managers are there. I have a shelter manager who goes there, visits the family shelters actually, family and the single um, women shelters actually in house where they have a yard. We used to be, when I took over this organization six years ago, seven years ago, I've been in housing and shelter business for 28 years. So we were in a church and I was like, that's not okay. Cause there's no place for kids to play. So finally we built up our budget enough and um, we purchased a house where the children have a nice yard to play in. And um, it, the, they, ship, the, they cohabitate with, um, their kitchen is the same. They share the kitchen area. And then the women are on one side and the families are on the other and they have bathrooms and stuff there. So the case manager goes and makes sure they have what they need, addresses um, concerns and issues that they might be dealing with, um, manages people, you know, in a group of people, you're cohabitating, so it makes it a bit difficult. I mean, you can't live with a family sometimes. So, <laughs> so she goes and she does that, and she also kind of puts people on a pathway to move forward in their life, shows them the direction, meets them where they are, so we don't... Um, force anything on people, like, you know, you gotta go do this, you gotta do that. It's a simple suggestion, progressive mm -hmm. engagement. We're having that conversation, encouraging, you know, and hopefully when they cohabitate, it's kind of like um, uh, blended populations. So if one person's doing something, the studies have shown that, you know, through behavior, they're like, wow, they got that, so maybe I can do that. So then they see that direction that they're making them move mm -hmm. towards. And our single men shelter is actually in an apartment complex that we own in downtown um, Centralia. And the back part of it is our men's shelter. So that's where our men stay. We can go up to 13 in the family shelter. We can go up to 20, I mean, this family and the single women, we can have 26. We also are the organization that is the one entry for coordinated entry. So everyone in our community comes through our doors and we put them in the homeless management information system. We put them out in the community. If we can help them in the community, if we can't help them, we have no, we have an open door policy, no wrong door. So whenever they come to us, we try and figure out where we can put them in the community or we can do it within our, um, mm -hmm. our actual building. We, I have an outreach team that goes out and does. Um, can you, can we think about in this conversation how we talk about the services we provide here and how it's different in Lewis County. I think that, uh, you know, that it's got its own, we kind of talked about kind of the rural aspect of that and a, a community that maybe doesn't broadly understand housing and homelessness issues historically in the same way that uh, maybe other communities or has conceived that work. Cole from Gather Church, can you talk about that? Um, kind of what is that like to provide those services in Lewis County? Can I ask you one question? So this is a nonprofit. Correct. And who find it, how do you finance this operation? We get funding from um, Department of Commerce, mm -hmm. and we have some money. You get, the, you get funding from Lewis County. Lewis, Lewis County. County. Lewis County. Lewis County. <laughs> <laughs> it goes through Lewis County. I, I, I'm looking at the umbrella. I was getting down there, JP. So, <laughs> Commerce, HUD, Lewis County, we actually get 2163 money to support our coordinated entry and our outreach team that does stuff like that. Um, we have the McKinney, McKinney program, which we've had for quite some time. So, and that's about it. And United, a little bit of United Way money, not a lot. So we do the rent well program with them. So, but that's where we get their money. Yeah. And we Thank try you. and make it all work. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll certainly try and address your question, JP. Um, so I'm Cole Meckley, and I'm the founding pastor of Gather Church. Uh, we operate a, uh, a eat free cafe. Um, it's a, basically a daytime shelter. Uh, we work with people just in poverty in general, of course, that and experience a lot of people that are dealing with substance use disorder, <coughs> people that are dealing with behavioral health struggles, a lot of folks that are dealing with housing issues. Um, also, again, just people that are in poverty on the verge of losing housing or unable to pay their utilities, things like that. We operate a low barrier uh, food um, resource, uh, uh, food bank, uh, serve over 2,000 uh, pounds of food every two weeks, about 4,000 pounds of food every, every month. Um, we serve approximately 3,000 cooked meals every month. So anyway, we interact with a lot of people in the community. Just about everyone that comes into town or is dealing with some issues is referred to, gathered to hang out to try and meet some other needs to address the problems. We have 11 paid staff, um, many of them, four of them in particular, work as case managers. So connecting relationally with people to help learn their story, understand what situations they're facing. 
and walk with them through whatever hurdles and trying to overcome whatever hurdles that they face. Um, so some of the uniqueness is, there's, we also, there's so many other things that we do. We have a five bed transitional living facility for men. Um, work with them fairly long term to help kind of create an opportunity for a more sustainable life. Um, so as far as some of the specifics of Lewis County, and I used to work in Seattle as well. I was downtown Seattle, worked for the Union Gospel Mission down there for a while. And, um, that was about 12 years ago when I was coming down here to found this organization. But um, so, you know, if, they're, if it's true that people stereotype the homeless, uh, that's probably as true in Lewis County as it is just about any place else. Mm -hmm. And people are very much lumped into one group of, of people. Um, they're criminals or they're drug addicts or they're both. And of course, that's not reality whatsoever. Um, as if, if, if it was, we still wouldn't need to address those, those issues. Um, but, uh, but there's, again, a lot of stereotyping that goes on in Lewis County, unfortunately. All of these agencies represented here today understand that what the reality actually is, and there's the need then to change public perception of the issues that we face. Um, part of that issue then too is that there simply, as Ruth has pointed out, what, you have 38 beds total, and then there's the ability to shelter 50 people during the cold weather months. Uh, we simply don't have the infrastructure that we need here. And again, part of that is due to public perception. People don't want to necessarily get as much skin in the game as they could if they had a different idea of the situations and what we actually face. The realities are we have like currently five families with young children that we're having to put in hotels because there is no place else in this county to put people um, to help right what's going on in their lives. And it's really difficult when you're living out of a hotel to uh, address the things that you're facing, right? When you have to check in and out of a hotel on a weekly or monthly or sometimes daily basis. We have a growing number of senior citizens that are unhoused right now. I currently am on the prowl for, if you will, looking out for there's a family of three, two of whom are in their 80s, one of whom are in their 60s, that have been living in their car for the last three weeks. And that's on top of the five senior citizens that we're currently putting in hotels to because there simply is no place else to go. People are outpriced in the housing market here. Um, they, you know, lose their housing. A lot of the seniors' stories are that they've gone into uh, having to be in the hospital for an extended period of time, going to nursing care after that. They no longer need the nursing care and they're put back out on the street and they end up at Gather or a housing resource center or a Salvation Army or all of the above. And there simply is no place for folks to live. And so we need to absolutely address affordable housing issues in our community. Um, again, the change of public perception is a huge part of that. Um, and we're, I know that every agency here is working hard to change people's <coughs> opinions on housing. Um, but what isn't helped is when we don't have a place for people to go. And so folks, folks just simply congregate on our streets, you know, mm -hmm. and then, so. Thank you, Cole. Absolutely. Jen from Salvation Army, I, I think that, you know, they probably got a lot of similarities, but the things that Cole shared, you heard from Ruth or Lisa, that when you think about working in Lewis County and coming from Tacoma and coming from a bigger community and then seeing how we're, we're looking to address this issue. What, what's your perspective? So our biggest frustration is um, coming from King County and then Pierce County and then going to Lewis County is um, people have voucher in hand in Pierce County or King County and we can get them into mm -hmm. housing in like 24, 48 hours. We have, a, we have landlords that are willing to rent to people that are formerly homeless. Um, but it's, uh, here we can have people with voucher that are high functioning, not a lot of barriers, and we continue to see issue, I mean, I was sharing this with Ruth before the meeting, that um, they will have vouchers in hand, to, and we have the ability, we have CHG 2163 funds as well, to be able to support um, housing and to be able to do you know, deposits so that people can really come off the streets and we have the ability to do that financially. Um, in some capacity, but we just don't have the places to put them. You know, and uh, me as a, you know, kind of high functioning individual, um, if I'm having a hard time walking alongside people, or case manager having a hard time getting housing for people, um, there's a problem. And then part of that is like how Cole touched on is that there's this misconception that these people are from some other area and they're not our problem. Well, the reality is is that we sit, um, you know, all of us sit in the same room with the individuals, and they're people that have, you know, their parents owned a dairy farm, you know, uh, you know, in PL or whatever, you know, and um, and and they're people. These are our people, and we have the ability to to rise above this. But we just need the resources. We need housing resources 
um, to be able to do that. And it is incredibly frustrating as a service provider to see people that we care about, people that have longevity, that have um, an attachment to Lewis County, and um, are incredibly resilient to come to a county that's underserviced and continue to maintain homelessness um, be, because they um, because we just don't have the resources, we don't have the housing resources, um, and that's like that's like a you know a, a, a shelter that's open you know all year round as a triage, and then having those those um, transitional housing to get people into like long term sustainable housing because um, it, the. I believe that the cold weather shelter is amazing. It saves lives and we keep people, you know, our residents alive. But at the end of the, the season, it becomes frustrating because people that did have housing now don't have housing and then we kind of repeat the cycle. And it's like, we have the ability to help them, but we just don't have the ability to help them with housing. I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm, and as moderator, I'm trying to move us because I know your schedule's tight and it's, important that we were mindful of that. I want to kind of jump out for a minute from a service provider perspective. And Peter Arbarno is a community volunteer. I think someone who, without being kind of a direct service provider, has a sense of, um, you know, in the previous meeting we talked about this kind of volunteer spirit and how can we tap into that? How do you hold that spirit of wanting to tap into our volunteer base, especially our faith-based volunteers, people like Peter Arbarno, and, and keep you guys committed into coming into the system. How do you see that working? What do we need to have in mind as we, as we try to go forward and keep what we have intact? Well, first, th thanks for coming in and, and continuing this conversation and this dialogue down here in Lewis County. I, I mean, with, with volunteers, it's not hard to, to be involved as a volunteer in this community, listening to stories uh, from Ruth and Lisa and Cole and Jen. Uh, it, it's so important. We, we know the clients down here. We know the individuals, and, and, and as a volunteer, you get really connected to these folks in the community. Um, I wear a lot of different hats in this community. My favorite, obviously, is being a volunteer because you get to interact with these people on a daily basis. Um, what I would emphasize as, as we move forward as a community, um, a, as a state, is to, is to to remain flexible and continue to allow the, the, the kind of local control of these types of programs. Seattle is Seattle, Olympia is Olympia. In, in Lewis County, if, if anything, um, I kind of kind of built up my belief that uh, local control was important. It was listening to stories about Lisa and Ruth and Cole, because nobody knows these people and their needs better than they do. Um, I think affordable housing is one part of this, but I think housing generally is important. Um, you look at Centralia, for instance, uh, one of the real struggles that a lot of rural cities and rural communities have is our infrastructure is old. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about building respite care, we can talk about building transitional housing, we need housing. Mm -hmm. And we don't need just low income housing, we need all housing. And, and I think that uh, greater investment in infrastructure, whether it be uh, sewers and getting people off of septic so that we can pull sewer lines so we can start building residences, I think that should be all of our long-term goal, and I know it's not, you know, if we're, if we're dealing with a cold weather shelter, we're not always thinking about, all right, let's talk sewer or stormwater, right? But I, I think when we look at our infrastructure, this is aging, um, and we haven't had a Microsoft come in and invest the kind of money to improve it. So, you know, I, I know it's a roundabout way of, of talking about volunteerism, but what I see is I see um, as a volunteer, I see these folks who, some of them had mental health issues, some of them had drug addiction issues, some of them went through traumatic life experiences. Mm -hmm. It's a complex issue. I think we need to play the short game with housing and the respite level, and we need to play the long game of reinvesting in infrastructure because I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old, and I want them in 10 years graduating high school and going through these same issues that I'm going through and sitting around the same table saying, what are we doing about homelessness? Mm -hmm. And recognizing that we haven't built any more housing mm -hmm. and we haven't done the things that we need to do. So um, I'm, just, I'm excited just to be around the table with uh, everyone who's working really hard. Um, I know Sunday morning I'm gonna be at the cold weather shelter. And I know Sunday morning when I'm checking some of them out, Lisa's gonna be picking them up and taking them to the gospel mission uh, for food. Um, as a volunteer, I love seeing this connection. I love seeing everybody around the table Better coordination, we could always have that. But 
I want to make sure that we keep it as a local coordination rather than having someone else from Seattle tell us, hey, this is how you got to run your cold weather shelter. That, that's something that I don't think works in our community or Yakima or Longview. I think, I think we need more local control. So. I, uh, I know that, like I shared, we've got a couple other things to do. We want to take a tour of the cold weather shelter, and so I think Laura and Josh are going to lead us on that. But before we do, uh, Commissioner Fung kind of opened us up in our first meeting. Commissioner Jackson is also here. And kind of from a county leadership perspective, how do you see us moving forward and working with the governor on this? Well, first of all, Governor Inslee, Mrs. Inslee, thank you for coming. You were a good man in bringing your better half with you today. That's awesome. <laughs> um, Governor, there is not anything I can add to this conversation. I think the professionals around this table, you know, they have the experience. They have, they put in the legwork, they put in the time. And I think you can see that uh, countywide, there are efforts all over our county to try to tackle this issue. Um, one of the things that makes me proud of living in Lewis County is the fact that if we have an issue, we deal with it. We, we, we go to work on it. We uh, have a very, very good can-do attitude. You know, if we have resources. And that's one of the things that we'd like to ask you for, the resources to be able to do the things we need to do. Uh, for me as a legislator, um, there are some things that are not political, and this is one of them. This is not a Republican-Democrat issue. It's not a liberal-conservative issue. This is a, an issue about people and where they are. We've got people from all walks of life that are either in generational poverty, they're in poverty because of traumatic events in their lives, and while we've dealt with talking about the stereotype and some of the other issues, there are people literally living out of the back of their vehicles that have jobs, they have children they're getting to school, they're working hard to have some kind of a life, but the problem boils down to affordable housing. Um, they would be in a home someplace if they had one that they could afford. And so I know that's one of your top priorities uh, for, you know, as a leader, and it's a huge priority for us here in Lewis County. And so, uh, perhaps as the last local legislator you'll have to talk to today, <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you. You honor us by coming here to talk with us, and we deeply appreciate your, your concern and your commitment to, to homelessness. Mm -hmm. And we're looking forward to see, you know, what, uh, what kind of uh, productive directions we can, we can find ourselves in. So again, on behalf of the entire county and on behalf of the Board of County Commissioners, thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Can I ask a couple questions? Of course. Yeah, so uh, Peter and, uh, raised this issue of wanting to have flexibility for local communities. What barriers to that exist or what concerns do you have about restrictions, prohibitions that would restrict your flexibility? So we are currently going through the process with the Department of Commerce to write our five-year plan. Mm -hmm. And that five-year plan will dictate how we spend all our 21 and 2060 dollars. Those are the, that, that's the bulk that we get. There's CHG, which is a Consolidated Housing Homeless Grant. Mm -hmm. And then there's 2163 and 2060, which are document recording fees locally generated that we then send out. That five-year plan, um, I thought we were gonna get done the first three months that I came on as deputy director two years ago. We, we're now kind of in our final back and forth with the consultants hired by the Department of Commerce to, to make sure that those are gonna meet their needs. Every county in the state of Washington is expected to perform at the top 20 percent um, in the state um, <laughs> to um, exit to permanent housing um, and that's that's a high mark for everybody especially for us um, there's a there's a, a requirement to emphasize those who have the highest level of need and i've seen the, the how they came up with that and I, I think it makes sense there's also some common sense that we've got to use in the play. We go, we can get this person in the wind pile if we can do this thing for them right now. We can connect them with that. And we want to be able to do that. So we want to do both. And as we go forward with our um, five-year plan, we, it will be ratified by our local um, legislators, by the Board of County Commissioners next month. We've got a hearing in November for that. We hope that it's approved by the state of Washington. It's been incredibly prescriptive how that needs to be. And, um, I think there are ways that there's more room for back and forth on kind of what the playbook needs to be. And, and maybe there's more flexibility there than, than we've presumed. But it's been incredibly prescriptive. And of the goals, they were all generated by the state. And so 
Um, I think that we go forward with that, and we can use that as a basis, but as we work with the Department of Commerce and try to develop not just adequate low barrier shelter access, but those exits into the community, that's, that's our strength. We've got groups of volunteers, we've got people that want to be activated in this, that if we, can, if we can conceive that in a way where they feel supported, their efforts thus far feel honored, then we don't lose that. But that's, that's a real concern if we were to go into kind of a bigger, low barrier shelter situation um, that we, we try to pay four people to save 500 when we've got 200 people that might be able to step up and help save two. I don't understand that. We need that. I mean that we've got a large volunteer base mm -hmm. that we need them to be active to meet and enter into relationship with the homeless people. Mm -hmm. People, I, I was a jail transition coordinator for years and I know what it's like to try to get someone to not come back into jail. And if they don't have a relationship with another person that's not paid, that actually cares about them, that returns them to citizenship, that gives them access to the community, yeah, some responsibility comes with that too. It, it won't work. It doesn't work. And that's what we're concerned could happen is that our ability to make those relationships with the people like the people at this table and those individuals will somehow, although I'm sure through the best efforts, will be conceived in a way that, that, that doesn't make that possible. And maybe, so tell, maybe, me, tell me how that would work. I mean, what is it? What would the State Department of Commerce do to inhibit you from working with Cole's staff to find those relationships? What could happen is if we have to prioritize um, exits to permanent housing and we have to prioritize serving those at the highest need, then say we have 40 shelter beds. And you know, I think, I think Ruth could even talk to this. How what happens is um, there are people that we, we feel like we could help, that we want to help, but that we are required to help a, a different population. I think we can do both, but we need more ammo. You know, we need to, we do need to do both. Right now, we have eight hundred seventy-five thousand dollars in our local document recording fees. That's a lot of money to us in Lewis County, and we need to figure out with this five-year plan how we can use that to get the most bang for our buck. And if we do it just all in low-barrier shelter, and we don't support those programs, we know have that the muscle for us to bring those people back into our community. We'll miss an opportunity. So we need to do both. We need help with the low barrier and we need them to make sure that it has those exits into the strengths of our community. Good to know. Well, I appreciate you identifying those challenges. Uh, you know, there is, this is not an easy issue because the state has responsibility to our shareholders, our taxpayers. We want to make sure that That's that money you. has, <laughs> we want to make sure that money is well invested and well spent. We also want to make sure legitimately that you just don't skim the cream off the population, right? So. If we just hand out money and all we take care of is the top 10% because they're the easiest and it makes our numbers look good, but the people with chemical addiction problems and serious mental health, but we don't get to them, mm -hmm. you know, we're not achieving our goal. So this tension is a hard one to figure out to dial exactly right between flexibility of the people on the ground and responsibility to get something for the investment. And But I really appreciate you identifying those because I'll talk to my department about it and, See if we're dialing it right. And we'd love to stay involved and to kind of help do that. And there's a way to do that directly when we're talking to Congress in our contract. But if there was a way to do that outside of it, to have is there is there a count is there a statewide county group of people in your position yeah. to help Commerce on this? Yeah. Like there an is organization? WASAP, you know, is one organization. Uh, do people CHS. share, do, do most of your compatriots share your kind of view on this? Yeah, and I think you may be meeting with Kirsten Kitsap soon, mm -hmm. um, and she yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. Um, and she's going to have some great policy recommendations. Mm -hmm. well, similar. Well, we'd yeah. like to, I mean, the more we can have um, uh, a consensus of the group as to what needs to be done, the better. And so it'd be good to engage the statewide group in this discussion. You know, if they can make a specific recommendation to us, I think it'd be a good thing. Well, no, ad hoc or unhoc, but... Whatever, whatever. <laughs> so at the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance, where, where I'm, I'm representing today, we uh -huh. convene a group called the Homelessness Advisory Committee, uh -huh. and it is uh, representatives from every county around the state uh -huh. who are in similar positions with JP. So uh, that might be a place to start if there's not already a more formalized group to, to consult with. Well, yeah, I just think having... Um, the more the statewide group can make recommendations to us, I think would be helpful. And so that we're all, you know, 
singing off the same song sheet here. Uh, it'll be interesting to me because we're doing more and more listening tours around to see if you know how many other people kind of share your your viewpoint. It won't surprise me if they do, because this is a chronic tension between the grantor and the grantee. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have a great conversation. What he's talking about is okay. So you have I'll give you an example. So we have a men's shelter. We have one gentleman on just because this guy. So I'm just going to generalize. One gentleman sleeping in one bed. Active user has some mental health issues, some barriers, serious barriers. We're providing the same service that we're providing to a guy who, you know, maybe he had he was in jail for a while, came from the jail transition program, really wants to stay clean, mm -hmm. really wants to like mm -hmm. make his life moving. Mm -hmm. But the dude that's next to it is using actively because the rules are slow barrier you can't say I'm, well, i don't kick anybody out for anything the only reason i kick people out is aggressive abusive behavior mm -hmm. so it's really difficult for this gentleman to succeed when this gentleman is right. at the same path right and but that's we have the have an option for both we have to have an option for both. Like that's where energy. that's where you know the different populations and unfortunately we don't have the finances to do both Mm -hmm. You know, to have it, you know. Well, and the restrictions on the money keep that right. from happening. Like our yeah. our work, five yeah. transitional facility for men has mm -hmm. some barriers. We're painstakingly patient with people and continue yeah. to work with people with a lot of support. But there is no funding for a program like that where there are expectations. People do want to get clean. They do want to work on their lives. Yeah. And so, I mean, certainly we need low barrier. We have yeah. I'm a huge proponent of low barrier, but we need that and more. We need avenues, directions, pathways out of having to stay in a low barrier situation <coughs> where people can actually address the things that mm -hmm. are keeping them from. I meant to ask this last question, uh, Commissioner Jackson, if you can help. Is there a discussion of zoning issues to try to open up land in the urban Absolutely. corridor to try to get more dense housing? Yes, sir. Is that under discussion here? It is, and um, I know that uh, course the urban growth situation is, is, is it's an issue for us here mm -hmm. in, in the county. Um, I think that's part of the, the longer discussion that we need to have, but uh, yeah, we're running into some, I think we're running into a few barriers. And I think places like Morton, um, is an area where we think, gosh, could we put some more high density housing there? Mm -hmm. Is there a way that we could kind of we talk about helping people move into those um, situations where there's a little more accountability, a little more benefit? And could some of those be outside the IFA quarter? For our population, people are from Lewis County, a lot of people don't <coughs> want to live in the city. Um, and so, can we, is there some way that, you know, can that I, character, yeah, can I provide a specific example? So we have what's called in Lewis County, in your counties, Lamberts, which is a local area of more intense rural development. It's a little pocket of intense rural development, you know, that happens in, in little communities around the county. Mm -hmm. Under GMA, those are not allowed to expand at all, ever. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, with some ability, some a little bit of flexibility there, if there's a good piece of land sitting right next to the Lambert, that would be a great place for some low-income housing, you know, we want to have that opportunity. And so, so I think, you know, those are the, that's just an example. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking at. When we ask Commissioner Jackson that question, those are the kinds of things that we, we talk about here and look at. Are there, are there efforts to, to up-zone in the urban corridor going on in this county and municipal areas or not? Yeah, the cities, the cities do a lot of that, but, but we have been looking at some of our urban areas and urban growth areas lately and then have some discussions about how to, to situate those to best provide development, and we're, we're doing what we can. Well, the reason I ask is, and this is, you know, land use is controversial, so anything we say causes controversy, but there's a numerical reality that we have 130,000 people moving into the state every year, plus native population growth. And we're not growing any more acreage, which means we have to have, we either have more dense housing or we're going to have single occupancy housing right around, all around Mount Rainier National Park, right mm -hmm. up to the Ballard. It's one of the two. And I think it's the state's responsibility to encourage and enable municipalities to provide the density necessary to provide housing. And we're not doing that. I mean, 85% of Seattle is his own single occupancy and people can't, you know, 25 year olds with a college degree can't find a place to live. Mm -hmm. While 65 year olds like my age, we're living in our neighborhoods we grew up in and, and, and not allowing the increased density. And I think the state needs to grapple with this subject. Uh, and I think we're gonna have to have increased conversation about that at the state level to empower and encourage municipalities in this, in this direction.
correction. So, look forward to your further advice on it. Thank you for joining us today, Governor. Thank you. I'm very appreciative of you guys sharing your ideas. Uh, this is a statewide problem. You're not alone. Everybody, almost every community is, is experiencing this, and we really want the state to step up to help. We're not the only player in this, but we're, gonna, we're now trying to figure out the best investment in the best way. And, uh, yeah, we've since I've been governor, we put 175 million dollars more every single year since I've been governor. So we have been we have been responding, but we're not getting ahead of the curve. Yeah. One of the frustrations I think for the public is we are spending a lot more, but we're not solving the problem. Mm -hmm. And I almost think that we gotta we gotta find a solution that actually um, shows progress to the public. Mm -hmm. And I'm now grappling to figure out a way to do that. So this is very helpful, and I want to thank you for what you're doing. One last question. If you were going to think about the, all of the services that are provided, housing, you know, wraparound services, mental health, mentoring, in Lewis County, what's the split between public resources and you know, nonprofit private resources? If you were going to just guess, what would it be, do you think? I'd say it's close. When I think about what this low barrier shelter, or this cold water shelter, yeah, what you finance, what I finance, what coal finances, is what I think we're close. To, I think the value that the volunteers brought, I think we're close to fifty fifty. Okay. Well, thank you, Peter. Thank you for all your volunteer work. What are you doing? You're not volunteering. I'm an attorney. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> and a city councilor. <laughs> so Josh and Laura are now going to give us on the tour. Yeah. Yeah. See you there. Yeah. Let's see, where, where would you like a picture? Hi. Yeah, let's get it. Yeah. And now look at uh, oh. <laughs> these guys. <laughs> Thank you. Dante. And over here. <laughs> we sure enjoyed our last visit together. Yeah, that was really exciting. Yeah. Exciting yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> I don't know. And that's about the extent of his excitement. When you have that conversation with the media over here, I think you had one with the fair. Come on up. Chronicles, a couple others. So go ahead. Southwest Washington. What's that? Yeah. I think Trudy's right behind. Trudy's right behind. Remember, this is a good look right here. She said right behind me. You're not seeing Trudy. Yes. Yeah. You see Trudy? There we go. She was right behind me. Maybe she's talking to some residents. I'm in the way. 
Hold on, you missed me here. I'm, I'm Brian Green. I'm with uh, Liberty Champion. We've today because we, we've had oh. such tremendous successes in our state recently. Huge expansions of educational opportunities for college students. First public health care option. Uh, best uh, gender pay equity. Great first net neutrality. Tremendous clean energy work going on. But in the midst of uh, this enormous economic growth we're having, uh, we still have this homelessness issue that is bedeviling communities across the state. And so Trudy and I and my teams are looking for all of the advice we can get on how to structure a state um, uh, effort to help local communities. And uh, it was really, uh, really great to hear the insights of the people on the ground here of things that are working and can work better. And, Got some great ideas today about how to maintain flexibility for local programs, ideas about the need for wraparound services. In our earlier discussion, now you were not in this earlier discussion with county commissioners and some of the uh, nonprofits and locals talked about the importance of uh, supportive services, that it's not just the structure, it's the supportive services to help people make sure that they can be stable to deal with uh, problems of, of, of chemical affliction or mental health issues or lack of job training. And one of the messages I heard repeatedly today was the importance of those services as well as just the physical structure. Uh, now, what I also heard today, which is an important message, is that uh, we've had unfortunate stereotyping of folks who are homeless, which is unfortunate because a very significant part of the homeless people in our state are, are, are working today. In fact, I just heard about in the uh, cold weather shelter here, they had four fishermen who would get up and go fishing in the morning and be in the shelter today, but just couldn't afford the rents. So uh, it, this has been a very insightful meeting already, and I'm inspired by the community effort. There's huge volunteer efforts that are being expended. And one of the things we want to do is for to have as good a um, a joint effort as possible between state, local, city, county, and nonprofit, uh, faith community, nonprofits, uh, YMCA. We want to have make sure all of those pistons fire as well as we can together. And so, anyway, it's been a good visit today, and happy to stand for your questions. You mentioned in there talking about an, an effort to inventory state assets yes. to, to see mm -hmm. what way you can help with that. Yeah. Can you g give me a little more detail on? what that entails and where that's at in the process? Well, I've asked, I've directed uh, all of our, of our state agencies to look for surplus properties that may not be, have a high use right now in other agency business to see what could be available for either short or longer term housing. Uh, and we're in the midst of that. They have, they're responding to me in due pace. We haven't, we've got all the responses yet. Um, you know, I wish I could tell you right now there's some magic spot that I can point to we haven't identified that of, of yet. But I think that the housing challenge is one where all of us have some role. You know, cities, counties, nonprofit, the state, the federal government, everybody has some role and we just want to make sure that the state uh, turns over every rock we can to see how we could be of, of assistance in this regard. Now we have had profound improvements in state commitment. Uh, since I've been governor, every year we've put in an additional $175 million uh, into our budget. Uh, uh, and, and so we've done a lot of significant increasing in the last several years of our services. But the demand has met or exceeded that increase. And that has been a, uh, the reasons are complex. They're the fact that 130,000 people are moving into this state and, as we're, and we're not building adequate housing for them, so they're driving up the rents, and every time rents go up, $100 housing homelessness goes up because 
Wages are not going up as fast as rents. Uh, we've had the opioid crisis, which is driving people and, and such personal challenges, and we have a mental health uh, challenge that is our mental health system has was gutted during the recession, and we've been building it up for the last several years, and we're continuing to do that, including fashioning a new way to do mental health so it's more community-based. So we're bringing our mental health care delivery system in the state up to sort of current standards, and we're still in the middle of that process. What about those small, small communities that don't have the resources? What are the state doing to help those? I represent a ton of small communities. Mm -hmm. Well, this is one of the things I mentioned in providing mental health care. We want to provide it closer to where people live, including in smaller communities. So that's one of our efforts to expand mental health care services to be more available to smaller uh, communities. Um, and the housing aspect of it? And the housing, uh, we just got to, we have to have additional capital be made available for housing. And it's got to be increased subsidization in part, because again, wages are simply not keeping pace with the increase in, in rent. But it's not just low-income housing. We need to build more housing up and down the pay scale, if you will. We need more middle-class housing. And one of the issues on that is we have to inspire the ability of having increased density in our cities because we're not building any more acreage. Uh, I think I'm a decent governor, but I haven't built any additional acreage <laughs> in the state. So we, ha we have to have more increased density, uh, and, and that means we have to consider some of our zoning issues. Otherwise, our, our young people just won't have housing, even if they do have a great job. So one of the issues we're doing uh, is, is the state trying to enable uh, local communities to make local zoning decisions that allow more dense housing so people can have housing. And that's really the only option we have because we have, we have such a, uh, a robust economy, people from moving in from all over the country are taking these jobs in the state of Washington. I think we have time for one or two more questions. We need to go. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm from New York City, and we have a lot That's of the okay. same. We have a lot of the same <laughs> problems. We have a lot of the same <laughs> problems where where you know I'm from, and you mentioned the mental health issue. Uh -huh. um, is there a mechanism in place to, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, ha make sure that these people ensure that these people are being diagnosed, or do they have to, you know, seek help, or how does how does that work exactly? Well, uh, uh, we are improving the ability to do that, and, mm -hmm. and this has to do with what I talked about as reforming our mental health care delivery system so it's more accessible to people. It's where they live in a smaller community, mm -hmm. so they don't have to drive 100 miles to get that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And we're doing some things here in Lewis County. We're talking to the sheriff about having better assessment of people's problems, for instance, when you come to the county jail. And the county jails have been sort of the de facto mental health care facility for too long. We're trying to create mental health services, take it off the shoulders of the jail and put it on the mental health care system. And mm -hmm. one of the things that's been proving effective, including here I think, is to do the diagnosis and the initial intake right at the jail. Everett is also doing this. Uh, Snohomish County has a program to provide mental health services just right sort of adjacent to the jail. It's been very successful. So yes, that is going on because of uh, a very large percentage of our people in our county jails have some untreated mental health problem or chemical problem. So I think every sheriff you talk to and police chief will tell you this, they want more mental health services and chemical services to serve these people so they're not just a, you know, a rotating door in and out of the county jail. All right, thanks. All right, thanks everybody. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.